Uh, yeah, today we're going to cover chapter seven, extending explore theory. So what we are going to do is to constrain explore theory, which means we are going to uh, to sort out some problems with explore theory. Okay. So please remember, uh, extending. We are going to extend explore theory because it's limited, or we can say that. Okay, it has some shortcomings that we're going to cover today. So um, the first problem with expert theory is related to the properties of the phrase. So uh, we said last time, the properties of the phrase, a phrase must be or must include one and only one lexical category, if you still remember. Uh, can you please remind us of these properties? Professor? Okay. Uh, Ms. Neymar? For example, an XP must have X as its head, which is the lexical uh, ca category. Well, just one lexical category, for example, MP or VP, must have only a V as a, its head. Okay, right, thank you. So, uh, one of the most important properties of a phrase is that the phrase must contain one and only one lexical category. Fine. So, uh, reflecting on what we did before, can you think of, well, a phrase that contains two lexical categories? One of the problems in XBAR theory. Do you remember the rule of the NP? Yes, this is one of one of the problems. Okay, so look at the rule of the NP. We said the NP contains a determiner and noun. Determiner and noun. So I was Master. expecting you to ask to ask this question. Okay. Yes, Mr. Sliman. Okay, so uh, I was um, expecting you when we talked about. Uh, I was going to answer your question about uh, the phrase that contains two uh, lexical categories. Yes, uh -huh, uh, it's the INPI, so we have it here, okay? So uh, as you can see here, there is a problem. How? Because the INPI contains two lexical categories. We have the determiner is lexical. There is no P here, there is no phrase. And we have N as a lexical category. This is problematic, okay? Or we can have here N bar, okay, N bar. Right, so in x bar theory, we said the determiner is sister to N bar dominated by N P. Fine. Now, since the determiner is also a lexical category, so it has the ability to head the phrase, okay, uh, rather than the, the noun. Okay, so remember, if there are two lexical categories, as uh, we have here, the NP contains determiner noun. So if you have two lexical categories, it means that both have the ability to head the phrase because both of them are lexical. So, which means that this phrase can be called noun phrase or determiner phrase. Noun phrase or determiner phrase because both of them are lexical categories. So, both of them have the ability to head the phrase. Indeed. Indeed. We are going to claim that it's better to call it determiner phrase rather than noun phrase for some reason. And this is what we are going to okay, discuss. So we are going to claim that the determiner is the head of the phrase. And we call it DP, not NP. Okay? So this is the first point or okay, we, we need to talk about. 
DP, determinant phrases. So what is a DP? DP is the NP, but we no longer call it an NP. We should call it a DP. Why DP? Because as we said, in the noun phrase, there are two categories that are lexical. We have the determinant and noun. Both of them are lexical, which means both of them have the possibility, the ability to be the head of the phrase. So in X-bar theory, we said the noun is the head. Fine. But today, we are going to claim that it is the determiner which is the head because of some argument. OK? So this is. So in the previous chapter, we put the terms in the specifiers of, of NPs, OK? Uh, in X-bar theory, we said determiner is sister to N-bar dominated by the phrase, OK? Sister to N-bar dominated by the phrase, OK? Which means it's in the position of specifier, specifier. So this, however, violates one of the basic principles in the underlying X-bar theory. All non-head material must be phrasal. So this is what we have been talking about. Okay, we said that uh, if determiner is not the head, then why is it lexical? Why is it lexical? Because there is a rule in X-bar theory which says that every category, every material, every element which is not the head, it must be phrasal. It must be phrasal. So it's problematic here. We have determiner which is not a head and it's not phrasal. So from now on we consider NP as DP. Okay? We'll we'll see the, the arguments. Okay. Old this is the old view in X bar theory. The in P in bar determiner. So determinant in, in X bar theory is specifier. Specifier it is just as the in bar dominated by the phrase. Now, forget about this. Forget about this. So this is the new one, DP hypothesis. OK? So DP hypothesis. So uh, DP, D-bar, determiner, and the NP. So the new uh, DP hypothesis states that the head of the phrase is not the noun. In a noun phrase, the head is not the noun. So we shouldn't call it a noun phrase. We should call it a determinant phrase. The head is the determiner, syntactically speaking. Because if you think of it semantically, you will say, well, what is the most important element in that phrase? It's the noun, so it's the head. So we're talking syntactically. So uh, determiner phrase D bar. This is the the one that you must follow. Okay, D P, D bar, D zero bar. Then the N P, which means that look at the position of the N P. The N P is sister to D zero bar, dominated by D bar. Okay. So first you start with D P, then D bar, then D zero bar, then the N P. This is this is what you should write in the exam. Forget about the old view. You have to adopt this one. Whenever you have a noun phrase, you should start with DP, D bar, D in Peter. For example, if we have the man, the man, so we should write DP, D bar, D. The we we'll write the here, then in P, in bar, noun man. Suppose that we have just man. So we are going to write D bar. D0 bar, uh, D1 bar, D, D0 bar, we have nothing here. And then in P, in bar, now then you write man. When you have just man, you should start with DP, D bar, D0 bar, in P, etc. Which means whenever there is a noun phrase, whether you have the determiner or not, you should start with DP, D bar, etc. Okay? So, now it's clear. Now why? Okay. Why do we need to adopt this hypothesis? First, first, it solves this problem. 
Okay, it solves the problem that we have two lexical categories. Look at look at the, the, the diagram at the top. Okay, here we have the in P and we have determinant and we have in bar. Theoretically this is problematic because we have two lexical categories. So it's problematic. But now with the DP hypothesis, if we claim that determiner is the head rather than the noun, then we solve this problem. Then we no longer have two lexical categories. Please remember this. So in the exam, I might ask you, so what is the problem in this tree, for example, in P, D, or in bar, or what are the arguments, okay, on which DP hypothesis is based? So you should say DP hypothesis, okay, emerges or is based on the fact uh, is based on the fact that there is a theoretical problem in the X bar uh, uh, structure of the in P. So the in P contains determinant and in bar two lexical categories, okay, which violate one of the basic principles of X bar theory, which requires that there must be one and only one head which is lexical in a certain phrase. So with DP, we solve this problem. We no longer have two lexical categories. Is, is it clear? This is only one argument. Is there any question before we move on to the other arguments in favor of DP rather than NP? Yes, please. Clear, Professor. Okay, um, yes, uh, this solution, as I said, solves the theoretical problem of the non-phrasality of the determinant. Non-phrasality, which means that, look at the old view. We have determiner and we have inbar. We have two lexical categories. So when we adopt DP rather than the NP, we solve the problem of the non-phrasality of determiner. The, the determiner is not a phrasal is lexical. So we solve this problem. Okay? So uh, the, it solves the theoretical problem of the non-phrasality of the determinant, but we still need empirical evidence in its favor. So at least, at least for the time being, DP hypothesis solves uh, uh, the theoretical problem of the non-phrasality of the determinant. Please pay attention. You, you may have some direct questions in the exam uh, in which, for example, I ask you, what are the arguments okay, that motivate DP uh, rather than, or the arguments that favor DP okay, to uh, 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 the NP? Okay? So you should say that DP, for, for at least for the time being, solves the theoretical problem of the non-phrasality of the determinant because we have two lexical categories okay uh, within the np which is which violates one of the principles of x bar theory that requires the uh, that in a phrase there must be one and only one lexical category which is the head now we need further arguments what is the empirical evidence for determiner to be the head of the np so one piece of evidence comes from the behavior of genitive possessive in peace. Okay, so we are going to talk about two possessive forms in English, of and apostrophe s, okay, genitive s, okay. There are two kinds of possessive in peace. The first is of genitive or free genitive. We're not concerned with this one. Genitive, possession, you say the code of. We use of. For example, the book of John, okay, the coat of the painter, the roof of the building, etc., the hat of the man standing over there. Which means, which means that to possessive form of, okay, is used here to indicate or to link between the possessor and the possessed. We're not going to talk about this. This is one genitive form. We use of to say that something belongs to somebody. Okay, the, the, the book of John. This is one form. This is called free genitive or of 
genitive. It is free because it, it stands alone. It is independent. And like the second one, which is a possessive S, or apostrophe S genitive, the second type of genitive in peace is what we are concerned with. It is called the construct or apostrophe S genitive. Okay, or possessive S. This is what we are concerned with. So there are two types of genitive form. Genitive form. The first one we use just of, and it is called the free genitive. We're not concerned with this one. We're concerned with the second type, the, the construct or the possessive S. Okay, here is an example, or three, here are some three examples. A, the panther's coat. B, the building's roof. C, the men standing over theirs hats. Now, uh, looking, looking at A and B, we notice that the S, the possessive S, is attached to the person who owns something, the, the possessor, the possessor. Okay, the Panthers, the buildings, the men's book, the uh, the husband's wife, etc., etc. Okay, so which means that the rule is that the genitive S is attached to the possessor, the person who possesses something. But what about C? What do you notice? So in C, yes, please, any remark the men standing over there's hat what do you notice uh, try to compare Professor? b and we'd say yes Alicia? Uh, in uh, c the possessive s is not attached to the owner of the hat because the owner of the hat is the, is at the beginning of the of the sentence exactly yes thank you um in in c the possessive s the genitive s is not attached to the possessor man it is attached to another word this means this means and this is very interesting this means that the possessive s is not simply a suffix because if it were simply a suffix then it would be attached to the possessor it must be attached to the possessor which is in this case man so the fact that uh, uh, the possessive s is not attached to the possessor man it means that it's not a suffix it's a small word it's a small word okay so notice that the possessive s marker appears after the entire possessor which is the man standing over there not okay after the real possessor okay which is man alone without the modifiers for example it attaches to the whole phrase the man standing over there not just to the head man so this means that the, this possessive s is not a suffix instead it seems to be a small word indicating possession okay so this possessive s is not a suffix because if it were a suffix then uh, uh, it must or it would be attached to the head man to the possessor okay so the second important evidence is that this possessive s is in complementary distribution with determiners. Now, this, this is the idea that I want you to focus on. Uh, please remember this one. This is the most important thing about the possessive S. It occurs in complementary distribution with determiners. Can anyone explain the meaning of complementary distribution? You did it in phenomenal. Professor? Okay, Naima? They occur in... Um mutually exclusive context they occur in um, they do not occur in the same environment like uh, each one in a in a con okay, in a okay, yeah thank you so they occur in mutually exclusive context 
Yes, the the environment where you find one, you can never find the other. Okay, as you know, there are, for example, allophones of the same phoneme and allomorphs. Allophones, for example, the aspirated p, t, and the k. Okay, voiceless stops that are aspirated in the initial position when they are followed by a stressed vowel. Okay, so th this rule of aspiration in English. So, p, the clear one or the plain one, and the aspirated one, p, and the unreleased one, p, that occurs in the final position, they can never occur in the same position. You always find the aspirated p in the initial position followed by a stressed vowel, or the, or we, we can better say in the onset position. And you always find the end released one in the final position. And you always find the plain one elsewhere. Elsewhere means in all contexts except that one, except the context where we find the aspirated one and the end released one. They can, they can never occur in the same position. For example, you can never find the aspirated p in the final position because in the final position you find the end released one. Okay? And you can never find the plain one or the end released p in the initial position before a, a, a stressed vowel. It's impossible. So, complementary distribution means also that, for example, a sound is always in the final position, while the other is always in the, in the in initial position. Or a sound is always intervocalic, which means between two vowels, intervocalic, and the other one is elsewhere. Now, uh, this is in phonology. Now, in syntax, complementary distribution, uh, you can never find determiners and the possessive s together in the same context, in the same environment. So, and the most important point is that if, uh, and it is similar to phonology, if, for example, two sounds are, for example, in complementary distribution, which means allophones, allophones, we say that they are allophones of the same phoneme. They are derived from the same basic sound. They are instances of the same thing. We say allophones of the same phoneme or allomorphs of the same morpheme, which means they are so the aspirated one and the uh, unreleased one and the, the plain one. All of them are just different realizations, manifestations. Uh, uh, okay, you can think of uh, the past ed past ed sometimes it is pronounced after voice sounds sometimes it is pronounced d after voice sounds sometimes it is pronounced as id or id after uh, uh, t and d after t and d like want wanted need needed which means after t and d and t and d are stops and alveolars okay so t and d and id are different realizations of of the id of the uh, id of the past so they are different instances they are different examples of the same entity of the same element of the same thing so this is the conclusion if two structures in a language occur in complementary distribution which means that they, they, they can never occur in the same position, in the same environment, it means that they are different examples, different instances of the same thing. So, coming back to this point, since the possessive S and determiners occur in complementary distribution, it means that there are instances of the same, the same thing, which means that the possessive S is also a determiner, is also a determiner, okay?
This is the argument, okay, that possessive S is a determinant. What is the argument? The argument is that it occurs in complement distribution with determiners. Any two structures, rules, or features that occur in complement distribution, it means that they are instances of the same thing, okay? Here's an, here are some examples. We cannot say the men's standing over there. We cannot say the buildings the the buildings the okay so we cannot find the possessive s followed by the terminal the panthers the the man seen over there is the the hat okay so these examples show that you can never find the possessive s closer to the determiner which means that the occurring complement distribution you can never find them closer which means that they are instances of the same thing which means that the possessive s is a determiner as well so all this explanation is just to prove that the possessive s is a determiner now we move to so any question so this is the first step we need to show the difference between these two genitive forms of genitive uh, it can occur with the look at the example the coat of the panther so we have of then the this is the reason why it is called free genitive it means you can it's not a determinant it's not a determinant because it occurs with determinant but possessive s is a determiner because it can never co-occur with uh, uh, determiners any question? Yes, please. Any question? Okay, we move on. If there is no question. Yes? So, uh, complementary distribution occurs whenever we have a separation between the position and the possessed, right? Uh, yes, syntactically, yes. Okay, okay so <clears throat> since the possessive S and determiners are in complement distribution, they are instances of the same thing. Okay, so and unlike the of uh, genitive, the possessive genitive S does not allow both the nouns to have a determiner okay we cannot say the man's the house we should say the man's house or the house of the man but we never say the man's the house so if possessive s is also a determiner how can we generate the following phrases in the old version so all this so uh, notice that we are going step by step first we have shown that possessive S is a determiner because it occurs in complement distribution with determiners. Now we know that possessive S is a determiner. So how can we uh, how can we branch a phrase like the men's house? The men's house. So we have two determiners. We have the the men the possessive S is another determiner. So how can we branch it within expert theory if we claim that the noun is the head? How can we do that? It is impossible. It is impossible to branch, okay, such, uh, uh, such uh, a phrase that contains two determiners using the NP version. And this is another example. The man standing over there's hat is similar to the man's house the man's house if you have two determiners in one phrase it is impossible to draw a tree okay for it using the np you must use the dp okay so we may try so the np and by the way the, the, the possessive s is always the head of the whole phrase for example 
the man standing over there is that this is the head the possessive s is the head of everything uh, within within the uh, within the dp <clears throat> but within the in p we cannot solve this this problem so let, let, let's try let's try so the in p this is a noun phrase we have the terminal uh, apostrophe s the head is hat the man in over there's hat and we have another in p which is, uh, uh, whose head is man, the man standing over there's hat. Okay, so how can we branch this one? There is a question mark here because it's impossible to branch it. There is no way. Okay, Be why? Because we have two determiners. The problem is that we have two determiners. So hat is not the head of the whole phrase. Okay, so we may uh, man is the head of the phrase here, but the problem here is is that we have two determiners. So if we start with this in P, then we are going to branch D and in bar and then determiner. Then in bar from in bar we derive uh, man, okay, man, which is the noun, the head. Then standing over there, the verb phrase. Then another NP or what? So it's difficult. Okay? It's not possible. So the XBAR rules don't provide any place to attach this predeterminate in P if the terminals are specifiers. Okay, think of another example, the men's house. How can you generate just the men's, the men's house? So you have one determiner, which is the, then you have the noun man, then you have another determiner, z, s, a possessive s, the men's. So how are you going to generate it? You have one determiner before the noun man, and one determiner is attached to man. How can you do that? It's impossible. So we can branch it only by using or adopting DP hypothesis. Okay, we can account for phrases like this. One, only by adopting DP hypothesis. Okay, so look at this example. So if we adopt DP, then we solve the problem. So DP, D bar, D zero bar, then the in P, and here we have DP. So, uh, by the way, uh, this is this is a rule. Please pay attention. As I already said, the possessive s is always the head. So this is the head. Okay, d p d bar d zero bar. This is the head, and this is like a specifier because it is sister to to x bar, dominated by the phrase. So this is the possessor. The person who possesses something okay and this is the, the the place the position of the possessed for example the man's house the man's house we are going to write here apostrophe s here which is the head of everything the whole phrase the man's house the head is that possessive s you may have it in the exam the man's house so that possessive S is the head of the whole phrase. And here we put the possessor, which is the man. So we, and then we continue, D bar, D zero bar. And from D zero bar, we write the, and then in bar, uh, then the in P, in bar, and we write man, okay? And the possess here, the man's house, the thing which is possessed is house. So we, we write it here. Okay, so here is an example. Here is an example, yes. So uh, this is the head of the whole phrase DP, D bar, D zero bar, apostrophe S. Okay, this is the head. So the possessor should be here, the possessor. So DP, D bar, then D, D zero bar, D. Okay, please remember. Please remember, 
forget about the input. You always start with DP. So DP, D bar, D zero bar, the input. The same thing here. DP, D bar, D zero bar, the input. Please remember that the input is always sister to D zero bar, dominated by D bar. Please remember this is this is a rule, and it's the final rule. Okay, the NP is sister to D zero bar, dominated by D uh, one bar. So in a in a noun phrase, you can never start with the NP. We always start with DP, D bar, D zero bar, then we move to the NP, etc. Okay, so the man standing over there. So, um, an example could be, as they said, the man's house, okay? So, the man's house, so the rule, the possessor and the possessed, so, okay, the man's house. Okay, so uh, the man's house, for example, the man's house. So the rule says, so the B, D bar, okay, D zero bar. This is the head of everything, and this is the, 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 the possessed. B, in bar, noun, house. So this is the head. Everything this S, and then the second DP, DP, D bar, D zero bar, which is D, and then the NP. So the NP is always sister to D zero bar, dominated by D bar. Okay, N bar, down, and man. Okay, so this is the rule. Okay, so you always have D, P, D bar, D zero bar, uh, possessive S, which is the head of the phrase. Then the N, P, in bar, noun, house. Then another N, P, D, P, D bar, etc. Now we finished with uh, D, P. So we're not, no longer going to call it N, P. It's a noun phrase. How do we know? We said there is a theoretical problem in smart theory. Okay, in, uh, in its part theory, the in P uh, contains determiner and a noun, which is problematic because there are two lexical categories. So one way to sort it out is to claim that the determiner is the head. So we need certain arguments. The argument is that, so uh, uh, the argument is that when we have two, uh, when we have two determiners, for example, the men's house, etc. But first, we explained, okay, we argued that that possessive S is a determiner because it occurs in complements and distribution with determiners. So, because it is a determiner, so uh, uh, how can we, since it's a determiner, how can we branch a tree with two determiners? For example, the man's house. It's impossible. The only way to do so is to claim that the determiner is the head of the phrase and you it's like you, you you kill two birds with one stone first you generate the sentence correctly second because it, if you if you claim that the in, the noun is the head you can't generate the sentence and second you solve the theoretical problem we no longer have two lexical categories as sisters Okay, now so we move to, to CP. You still remember the rule of the CP? Can anyone remind us of the rule of CP, the complementizer phrase? Yes, please. Yes, Miss Miss Adija. Uh, you know more, please. If you, yeah, okay. Yes, Adija. In the CP, we have uh, the complementizer. Then we have mm -hmm. the TP. 
and within the TP, we have noun, phrase, verb, phrase. Okay, 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 okay. So don't talk about CP. So CP within CP, we have complementizer and uh, TP. Okay, yes. But it's problematic again because the head in X bar theory is always obligatory. Look at these two rules. CP contains the complementizer and TP. Okay, and TP contains DP, which is the noun phrase, tense, and VP. Now let's start only with A talk in this section. Talk about A a lot. So the problem here: Why can anyone explain why uh, C is between? Uh, round brackets. Can anyone explain this? Yes, Adija. Uh, it's optional. We can have we have the we can have the complementizer, and this cannot be there. It can be just uh, optional if we have, for example, that. Examples, yes. Uh, for example, uh, the person I met, or the person uh -huh. that I met. Uh huh. Yes, so uh, the the C is optional because we may or may not have it. For example, I think that okay, you got the first mark. So I think that. So if you have that, okay, and in uh, if you have that, then you don't need those brackets. But if you don't have it, for example, I think you did it. So, which means that sometimes we have a complementizer, sometimes we don't. That's why we, we put it between two brackets. The problem is that, the problem is that this C is the head of the CP. Because here we have C, so this is the head, C is the head. Here we have TP, T is the head. So, what is the contradiction here? Can anyone explain it, please? Sleeman, Mr. Sleeman, yeah? Yes, Professor, the, the head must not be optional. It must be obligatory in a sentence, in a, in a phrase. Yes, so we, we, we said that sometimes we have the complementizer and sometimes we don't. That's why it should be between parentheses, but this is uh, contradictory because we are saying that the head is optional which is impossible okay it's impossible the head is not optional okay so this is the the old uh, rule CP the complementizer contains C and TP okay so we are going to change it the new CP rule is this CP C bar, C zero bar, then TP, which means we add this bar, we add this bar, so CP, C bar, and C. Why? We want to show that CP, its head is this complementizer, and it's obligatory, it's obligatory, okay? Okay, it's obligatory. So in DP, we said, D bar, a D, P, D bar, D zero bar, and in CP we have CP, C bar, C zero bar, and we will see TP, TP, T bar, T bar, T zero. Okay, it's very very easy. This is the main concern of this chapter is just uh, to claim that instead of the in P we should say DP, D bar, D zero bar, and CP. C bar, C zero bar, and TP, T bar, T zero bar, which means with DP, CP, and TP, what is new is that you move from the phrase to one bar to zero bar. Now, this is CP, okay? Do we have complementizers in English? Yes. We have complementizers in embedded clauses. Embedded clauses, okay? Embedded clauses obviously have complementizers. For example, for example, I think that you're nice. 
So that, you're nice, is an embedded clause. So we have complementizers in embedded clauses, okay? But do all clauses have CPs or do only embedded clauses have CPs? For example, um, he traveled yesterday. Do we have complementizer here? Of course, there is no complementizer. There is no that, whether it is realized or not. So what we are going to do, and this is very strange, maybe it may sound so to some of you. We are going to argue that all clauses, whether they are embedded or not, all clauses have CP. Okay? So there is evidence that all clauses, even root clauses or main clauses, requires some kind of complementizer. So we'll claim that some sentences have null complementizers. Okay? So please pay attention. In English, there are complementizers in embedded clauses. No doubt about that. Okay? Because we say it. We say, I think that, etc. But what about the main clauses? Main clauses are, I called you yesterday, uh, she wrote a nice paper, we will travel tomorrow, etc. These are the main clauses. Main clauses are, uh, the main clause is any clause which is not an embedded clause. Do we have complementizers there? Of course, no. But we are going to prove the opposite. We are going to prove that there exist complementizers in all clauses. Fine. How can we do this? We claim first that maybe, maybe, for example, when we say, I will travel tomorrow, maybe there is a complementizer in main clauses, such as, I will travel tomorrow, but this complementizer is not realized. Is not realized. It is null. It is null, not realized. To understand the meaning of null, let me give you a simple example. The word people. People, we say, for example, people are. People are. Why do we, why do we use are? What is the plural morpheme? Hmm? What is the plural morpheme? We say people are. We know that the word people is in the plural form, but there is no plural morpheme. We say, linguists say, linguists say, they, they call it a zero morpheme, okay, a zero morpheme. Uh, the same thing for the word uh, read. I read a paper yesterday. This sentence is in the past. But how do we know there is no past morpheme? There is no past morpheme, okay? So we say that there is a past morpheme there, but it is not written. It is not pr pronounced, which means it is not phonologically realized or morphologically realized. We say the people are, which means that there, the people is in the plural form, but the plural morpheme is not realized, okay? We say it is phonologically and morphologically realized. Okay, this is the meaning of null. So null means null means phonologically or morphologically unrealized. Okay, for example, when you say the people are, so there is no plural morpheme here, and we use are, which means that the plural morpheme is null. It's not realized, but it is there. So this is what we claim about the main clauses. In syntax, we say that maybe, maybe there is a complementizer even in the root clauses, the main clauses, but that complementizer is null. Okay? Is this idea clear first? Which means, uh, uh, for example, we say asparagus grows in California, we say that we have a complementizer, but it is null or I will travel tomorrow, so we have a complementizer, but it is null. 
So first, is this idea of null complementizer clear? Yes, it is, Professor. Fine. Now, we're going to use a cross-linguistic comparison. Okay? Cross-linguistic comparison to show that there are null complementizers in uh, uh, root clauses. Okay, so the evidence for this claim comes from cross-linguistic comparison of questions among languages, especially yes or no questions. So we're going to use yes or no questions. We're going to compare yes or no questions, okay, among languages and C. So, while in English, yes or no questions are formed with do insertion or subject ox inversion. If you want to form yes or no questions in English, there are two ways. You can insert do, verb to do, for example, do you like it? So you say yes or no. Or you say, did you travel yesterday? You should, your answer should be yes or no. So to form yes or no questions, we insert verb to do or we use subject augs inversion for example you say will you travel tomorrow okay will is is an auxiliary so we use subject augs inversion to form yes or no questions so these are the two ways to form yes or no questions in english good however in many other languages Yes or no questions are formed with a complementizer particle that precedes the verb. So, let me say it differently. There are some languages we are talking about yes or no questions. There are some languages in informing yes or no questions, some languages use do insertion or subject ox inversion while other languages do not use a uh, subject ox inversion they use a word a specific complementizer there are two examples of languages english and irish we'll, we'll use english and irish so english uses subject ox inversion or do insertion irish uses a specific complementizer which is r r now, what, what is interesting and what you should remember is that languages that use a specific complementizer to form yes or no questions do not use subject ox inversion. And languages that use subject ox inversion do not use a complementizer to form yes or no questions. Which means that the two things, they occur in complementary distribution. Languages that have a specific complementizer in forming yes or no questions do not use subject args inversion. And vice versa. Languages that, such as English that use subject args inversion to form yes or no questions do not have a complementizer in forming yes or no questions. Which means that if, if you use a complementizer in forming yes or no questions, you don't use subject ox inversion. If you use subject ox inversion in forming yes or no questions, you don't have or use a complementizer. This is cross-linguistically true which means languages that use subjects ox inversion do not use a complementizer in asking yes or no questions. This means that at least, at least in yes or no questions, there is a complementizer in English. How do we know? Because subject ox inversion and that specific complementizer occur in complementary distribution. So they are instances of the same thing which means that even in English at least in yes or no questions there is a complementizer so now we have we have proven that 
at least in yes or no questions, there is a complementizer in English. Yes or no questions, okay? Can anyone repeat this, please? Can anyone repeat what, what I have been talking about in yes or no questions and focus on cross-linguistic comparison? Because this is the evidence. This is the evidence to prove that there is a complementizer in yes or no questions in English. Who can repeat this? Mr. Sleeman, can, can you do that? Or click on the hand again if, if you have no answer. Khadija, yes, please. Yes, Professor. Um, there are two types of languages. Uh, when we want to uh, ask a yes-no question, for example, if we talk about the English language, uh, when we want to have uh, a yes-no answer, we use uh, do, or we use the uh, we use the subject ox inversion. For example, is it something like that? And there are in other languages when we do not use the ox. Uh, the subject's ox inversion, we use a complementizer to, uh, to ask a yes-no question. Uh -huh. So the, the idea is that, Naima, yes? Then I'll summarize. And uh, we said that um, Irish language uses a uh, complementizer while English uh, subject of inversion. Yes, so uh, to summarize, we said some languages such as English use subject of inversion to form yes or no questions, while other languages such as Irish use a specific complementizer. They don't use subjects of inversion. Fine, fine. But what is more interesting is that languages that use subject of inversion do not use a specific complementizer in forming yes or no questions. And languages that have a specific complementizer do not use subject of inversion. Languages that, ha that use subject of inversion do not use a, a specific complementizer. I'm talking only about yes or no questions. So they occur in complementary distribution. And remember, any two structures that uh, 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 are in complementary distribution are different instances of the same thing, which means that in English, in English, at least in yes or no questions, there are complementizers. Is this clear? So now we have proven there are yes, there are complementizers in yes or no questions. Okay. I have an example. Yes, questions are formed with a special particle, a complementizer R. Here is an example. So in Irish, for example, they say R, that's seen. So this R is a complementizer. But in English, there is do insertion. Or, or subject ox inversion, okay? So, this is the, the conclusion. Languages like English that use subject ox inversion don't have special complementizer question particles. If a language has complementizer question particles, then it will not have subject ox inversion. They occur in complementary distribution, which means that there are uh, two instances of the same thing. Okay, so do, do you see the slide? Yes, yes professor. professor. Okay, right. So it seems reasonable to claim that question complementizers and subjects ox inversion are part of the same basic phenomenon because they occur in complementary distribution, so they are uh, uh, a part of the same basic phenomenon. Okay, that's. There is a question complementizer particle in English, just like there is in Irish. The difference is that in English, this complementizer particle is null. So, you should understand the meaning of this null. 
in Irish, this uh, complementizer is not null. It's not null. It is realized we have it here. It's R. But in English, we have shown that there is a, a complementizer in yes or no questions. But it is not realized. We, we don't write it. We don't find it. Okay, It is null. We know that it is there. But it is not realized. But in Irish, it is realized. Okay? So we have to represent this by the, the, that null symbol. Okay? In, uh, this one is. We will represent this null complementizer with this symbol, null, plus Q plus questions, which means that there is a complementizer which is null in questions in question there is a null complementizer in questions okay so look at this uh, uh, tree but first this null complementizer has no phonological content which means you don't you you cannot pronounce it because it's not realized this is the meaning of no phonological content it is not written, so it is not pronounced, so it has no phonological content. But it must be realized or pronounced some way. The way English satisfies this requirement is by moving T into C head. So here we have a complementizer here, which is null. This plus Q means this is a question. This is a question. For example, will, it, will you take it? Will you take it? Where do you take it? This is a question, uh, plus Q, it's, it means this is a question. And here null, it means that we have a complementizer in the questions, but it is null. But in Irish, it's not null. You have to write R here. You have to write that complementizer. But in English, because there is a complementizer in, in questions, but it is not realized. So we, we, we write the symbol down. So, however, this complementizer must be spilled out. It must be spilled out, which means it must be pronounced or it must be uh, satisfied. It must be realized or pronounced. So the way how to pronounce it is to move this T to C. Okay, this T to C, we move it here in questions. For example, suppose that we have the question like... Uh, Will you travel? Will you travel? So we don't uh, draw the tree as a question, but as we have it in the deep structure, and it should be like the DP here, you, and the T will, and the VP travel. So you will travel. You will travel. DP here, you will, and the VP travel. However, this is plus Q feature. It must be spelled out. It must be pronounced. So we move T to, to C, which means we move will to C, and it becomes will you travel. Now it's a question. We'll talk about this in uh, Chapter 12, but this is uh, relevant here to explain this. You have to move to the T to C. When you have a question, for example, will you travel, you don't start with with will here and you hear any. No, you draw it as it as it is in the deep structure, and in the deep structure, it's not formed as a question. It is formed as you will travel, similar to to other questions like what did you do? What did you do? In the deep structure, it is you did what? You did what? This is the way how we are going to branch it in the tree. Then you move the question what to its uh, right position. Okay? So uh, it can be, so for the time being, just remember that this question, this complementizer is, is satisfied or is pronounced by moving T to C. So this results in the correct order because it's a question where the auxiliary in T now appears before the subject. Don't worry about this movement because we'll talk about it in chapter 12. So by contrast, languages like Irish don't utilize this mechanism because they have a particle that fills their uh, plus Q complementizer. So languages that have a null 
complement Pfizer in questions, this T must move to state. And languages that already have a complement Pfizer, such as Irish, already has R or N, so you simply write R or N here, and there is no movement of T to state. Similar to English in embedded clauses, in embedded clauses, there is that, that, you, etc. So you don't need to move T to C because you already have a T here. In questions, there is no compromise. You need to move T to C. So please remember, in English questions, there must be the movement of T to C. I'm giving you a, a hint. Okay, or uh, explain one aspect of movement that we are going to talk about next week. T to C movement. T must move to C in, in questions. To spell it, because it's null here. It's null, it must move. But in Irish, it is already a, a particle, a complementizer here. So it is already filled with R, which is the complementizer. Why do you need to move T to C? And it's already filled. Okay? So, to summarize, languages that have null complementizer in questions, which is null here, there must be the movement of T to C. Languages that already have a complementizer, it is realized there, such as Irish, you simply write it here. Any question? Any, any 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 question anything which is not clear yes please it's clear professor we 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 need discussion indeed but okay right okay so uh, the main points uh, I have covered so far con concerning uh, CP is uh, are the following. First, I said in uh, embedded clauses, there is a complementizer. It is realized it's not null, but in questions, yes or no questions, there is a complementizer, but we cannot see it's not realized, it's null. And I said, so we have to move it to C to pronounce it because it's not. But languages such as Irish already have a complementizer there, so there should be no movement. Indeed, English does have an Avert plus Q complementizer, but it's only found in embedded questions. Embedded questions like I asked if etc. Which means English has embedded question, has avert complementizer in questions, but not in yes or no questions, in embedded questions or in direct questions. When we have if, when we have if. Okay? So, this complementizer is if. So, note that subject ox inversion is completely disallowed. Look at this example. Fabio asked if clothes had run a marathon. This is a question, but it's an uh, indirect question. We say, asked if clothes had it. Or you, you can call it embedded question. Embedded question. So this if is a complementizer. Is a complementizer. So this is a question, embedded question, and we have a complementizer which means that we have the complementizer in embedded clauses, like I think that you did it, and we have an avert. Avert means it is realized you can see it. You can see if here. You can pronounce it. You have it here, if. This is the meaning of, uh, of avert. But null, there is no if. There is no that. You cannot see it, for example, in yes or no questions. Will, will you travel? Yes. What is the complementizer? 
there is no F, there is no that, there is no complementizer. But we know that based on cross-linguistic comparison with other languages, we know that it is there, but simply it is not realized. Some of you may not, may be confused. Well, what does it mean to say that it is there, but it is not realized? I'm telling you, think of the plural of people. What is the plural morpheme of people? We say people are. What is, what is the plural morpheme? We know that it is there, but it is not realized. Okay? It's the same thing. So when we say, will you travel? There is a complementizer there, but it is not realized. This is based on the cross-linguistic uh, uh, comparison with other languages. But in, in direct questions, when you say, John asked if, etc., there is a complementizer in questions, but th these are not yes or no questions. These are embedded questions. We have it here, if. But, but how do we know that if is a complementizer? It is a complementizer because you cannot use subject ox inversion next to if. This is the reason why B and C are incorrect. For example, Fabio asked if had clause. You see the, the, the subject auxiliary inversion? No, it should be clause had, not had clause or not had if. So B and C examples show that when you have if, you cannot use subject aux inversion. This means that if is a complementizer because it occurs with subject aux inversion in complement distribution. Okay, when you have if, you don't have subject aux inversion. Can any one of you tell tell me why we can't use subject ox inversion here? Why? Think of the tree. So who who is clever enough to answer this question? Who can who can try? Yes, sir. May I? Okay, Khadija, think of the tree. Mm -hmm. in fact, Why I, can't I we use subject of? In fact, I have another uh -huh. explanation. Uh, there, is a, there is a conditional that starts with had I, for example, or had you. Mm -hmm. So it may be, um, we may like mix things if we, if we make subject uh, ox inversion here. Mm -hmm. Okay, no problem, no problem. We, we are talking about syntax, okay? So look at this tree here. If we have if, and we write it down here, there is no need to have subject ox inversion because uh, uh, the position of C here is already filled with if. Why do you need because if you say, if you use subject ox inversion, it means that you need to move T to C. Remember in the questions, uh, you will travel. When we use subject ox inversion, okay, uh, for example, will you travel, which means we need to move to T C t to c okay will will we, we, we write it here will and uh, under dp we write you and under vp we write travel so you will travel but because this is a question we have to get the order of the question so we have to move t to c and it becomes will you travel so we use subject ox inversion so when we have if so we write we write if under C, which means that C is already filled with if. So why do you need to move T to C and under C you already have if? It is already filled with if. You see, I'm explaining it syntactically. Why uh, there, there should be no subject ox inversion with if? Because if takes the position of comp and if you subject ox inversion you must move t to c so there's no need to move t to c and c is already filled 
with the complement sizer f you see but here t moves to c because there is nothing in under c there is nothing under c is, is it clear yes professor yes professor okay so the b b and c here are incorrect because if occupies the this is what i i was explaining occupies okay the plus q complementizer so no subject ox inversion is required now th from now on just think of it in this way there is if subject ox inversion is not allowed you should know that the c of the complementizer is already filled is already filled with with a complementizer there The same thing we, we, we say, for example, I think that John will travel. I think that John will travel tomorrow. Can we say, I think that will John travel tomorrow? We can't use subject ox inversion after that because the complementizer is already filled, occupied by that. There is no need to move T to C. Okay. Now it's clear that sentences showing subject ox inversion use a null complementizer, and questions have an avert complementizer. I'm going to summarize, then move to the last point uh, as far as CPs are concerned. I said. In embedded clauses, there is a complementizer. For example, I think that, etc. In yes or no questions, there is a complementizer, but it is null. When you say, will you travel? We said based on cross linguistic comparison. So it's a there is a complementizer, but it's null. And in embedded questions, such as I asked if it there is a complementizer and it's avert. You find it there, it's avert. So in English, there is an avert complementizer in, in two, two positions with embedded uh, questions asked if, because you have if there, or with embedded clauses, I think that we have avert complementizer. But with yes or no questions, there is a null complementizer. You, you don't find it, you don't write it down, okay? This is the conclusion. Three main points. Three main points. First, it is an average complementizer with embedded clauses. I think that, etc. And there is an average complementizer with embedded questions. I ask if, etc. And the third point, there is an a null, not average, a null complementizer with yes or no questions. Okay. These are the three main points. So the last point to talk about is, I mean, not the question, but it's related to non-questions. Now we're going to generalize. So we have complementizers in embedded clauses. We have complementizers in questions. We are left with one thing. What is it? What is it? Please, what is it? Can you answer this question? We said we have complementizers in bad clauses. We have complementizers in uh, questions, whether embedded or not. So we are left with one thing. What is it? Can you say it, please? We are left with non questions. Yeah, non question statement. I will travel tomorrow. I'll take it. Uh, you did it yesterday, etc., etc. We we talked about the embedded clause. We talked about the questions, so we are left with non-questions, which is the statement. Statement. Okay, so that's the last point. What about non-question sentences? Okay, which means that we need to prove that there exists complementizers in all clauses in all english clauses whether they are statements simple sentences whether they are embedded or non-embedded or questions or whatever 
which is the last point, okay? So how can we do this? We're not going to use uh, complement distribution, but we are going to use coordination, coordination. Remember what we said in complement in a constituency test. What did we say? If to, you can conjoin, can, can, you, can you explain this, please? If you can join to the constituency test. Professor? Yes. If we can conjoin two uh, elements, uh, so they form constituency. Yes, which means that there are, there are instances of the same thing. For example, we say the man and the woman. We cannot say the man and the girl. The man and the girl. We say the man and the woman. Women. Why do we use conjunction between the man and the woman? Because they belong to the same syntactic category. Both of them are nouns. We can use also and uh, between verbs. We can say I'm speaking and eating. Why can we use uh, uh, and between these two elements? Because they belong to the same syntactic category. So there is a general rule. If you can use conjunction between elements, it means that they belong to the same thing. This is what we are going to do. Which means, if we can join a question that has a complementizer, but it's a no, it's not complementizer. If we can join a question, and we said that in English, questions have complementizers, but in yes or no questions, the complementizer is no, and in embedded questions, such as I asked if it's a trap, the complementizer is not null, it's avert. You can see it. Okay? So, if we can conjoin, if we can link these questions which have complementizers with non questions, with statements, then they are instances of the same entity, which means then uh, that it means that also in the statements that can be conjoined with questions. These statements have a complementizer. Have a complementizer. Okay? Now let's talk about it. So if you can conjoin a question that has a complementizer, we have proven this. We have shown that in English we have a complementizer in questions. So if you can conjoin a question with a non question, a statement, then that statement must also include a null complementizer which means a CP. Because it's impossible, it's impossible to, to, to link or to join a question that has a CP with a non-question that doesn't have a CP. It's impossible because it's like saying you can, you can join a noun with a verb. You can say the man and go. It's impossible. Okay, here is an example. Indeed, it is possible to conjoin a statement with a question. It's possible to, to join a question that has a complementizer with a statement. Here is an example. You can lead a horse to water, but will it drink? You can lead a horse to water, but will it drink? So what is the conclusion? Please pay attention. We have will it drink. We have the question here. This question has a complementizer. We said it. We said that in English there is a complementizer in yes or no question, but it is null. So we have a complementizer here in the second clause. Will it drink? And the argument that uh, we are going to use here is that since we can conjoin this question which has a complementizer with this statement you can lead a horse to water which has no complementizer but since we can link it we can join it with this question which has a complementizer it means this statement also has a complementizer and it is null as well because it doesn't make sense, it doesn't make sense to link a CP, this, this, this question that has a complementizer, with an, a non-question, with, with, a, with a clause which is not CP. It's impossible. It's like saying you can join 
an NP with a VP, like saying the man and go. Okay? So, uh, further explanation. So, since the second clause, which is will it drink, here shows subject ox invert, we know there is, there is a complementizer, but it is null. It's a question and there is a complementizer. Okay? By extended, we know that the clause it is conjoined with must also have a complementizer. This time, a non question. A C can only be conjoined with another CP. But, but let me give you a hypothetical data. Hypothetical data. Suppose that I say the man and uh, the man and Skilk. Okay, just. What is the syntactic category of skill? Can anyone answer, please? What is the syntactic category of skill? Professor? Yes? Remember? It must be a noun. It must be a noun as far as we can conjoin the two. Very good. Yes, it has to be a noun because an NP must be conjoined with something that is, that is similar to it in its syntactic category. You see, based on the rules, we can predict the syntactic categories of the words that are meaningless okay so the same thing here a cp can be conjoined only with another cp it's like saying that np can never be conjoined with with a vp okay so this is a cp with a drink because it has subject of inversion since you can conjoin it with another clause and we already know that a cp can conjoin can be conjoined only another CP. This means that this is a CP. There is only one difference. This is a question with a drink. That's why it has plus Q here. Plus Q. This is not a question. It's a statement. It has minus Q. Pay attention to this minus Q and plus Q. Okay. But both of them are similar because both of them has, has this symbol. Uh, uh, symbol empty or null. Null. Which is that will it drink there is a complementizer, but it's null. And you can lead a horse to water. This is a statement. It has a complementizer, but it, it's also null. But will it drink is a question. It has plus Q. You can lead a horse to water is a state. It has minus Q. It's not a question. Okay? Here is, here is an example. Okay? You see now? Uh, you, uh, you DP here, you can lead the horse water the, the VP, but the conjunction, will it drink? Will it drink? It will drink. So, here we have, will it drink? Here we have a question. So, it's plus Q. This is a statement. You can lead the horse to water. It's not a question, it's minus Q. And the conjunction between the two. Uh, look at this, the example. What is the example? We need the, 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 the example should be written here. Okay. Anyhow, so here we have, we have you, under DP, you, okay, you. Under T, as we said a long time ago, under T, we write the auxiliaries. We write the auxiliaries, will, should, can, will, etc. Okay. So, you can, and the V here is lead a horse to water. We don't, we don't need to, we're not interested in the details. So, the rule is the VP. So, you is DP, the subject, can is the auxiliary, VP, lead a horse to water, another, uh, the conjunction, but, yeah, then we have uh, 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 the second part, but, but, Will it drink? This is a question, but remember, we don't uh, draw it as a question first, but it should be as a statement. So you, here you, under DP you, and we'll here, and here the VP drink. But this is a question. We have to get the order of the question. So we have to move T to C to make it a question, okay? So will must move here. Now it becomes will it Will it drink? This has plus Q because this is a question. This has minus Q. This is not a question. Here we have two clauses. We have two clauses. We have 
you can lead us to water and uh, we drink. That's why we have two CPs. We have CP here. The first CP is for the first clause. Conjunction, the second clause. Please remember this. Whenever you have two clauses, you have to have three CPs. Another example. I will call you tomorrow and I will call you next week. So we have to write CP here. The first clause CP is I will call you tomorrow. Then we'll write the conjunction and. Then the second CP is I will call you next week. Okay? So please remember whenever you have two sentences, two clauses, you have to have three CPs. One just for uh, this one, you branch just the conjunction here and the first clause here and the second one here. Is it clear? Any question? So, the conclusion. Since we can, since we can conjoin a question that has a complementizer with a statement, it means that that statement also has a complementizer. So the conclusion is that from now on, we are going to use CP with all the clauses, all the clauses, whether it's an embedded clause or a question or an embedded question or a statement. Whenever you have a sentence or a clause, you must start with CP. Is it clear? Any question? So this is an argument for null complementizers attached to root clauses, even in simple statements like, uh, uh, I, will, I will go tomorrow, I will travel tomorrow, I will publish a book, etc., etc. So all statements have complementizers. How do we know? Because this is the argument. We can conjoin a simple statement with a question that has a complementizer. Okay? So we will assume that there is a CP on top of every clause. Every clause has a CP. Okay? So I'm going to uh, repeat again the main points we talked about in CP. Suppose that in the exam there is a question like what are the arguments in favor of CP? What are the arguments in favor of CP? Or what are types of CPs that exist in the language? Or how can you prove that there exists a CP on top of every clause? What are the arguments? Okay, so think of first there is an average complementizer in embedded clauses. I think that we have that there. Okay, there is in English, in embedded clauses, there is an average complementizer. Sometimes it's not. Anyhow. And in embedded questions such as I asked if, etc., there is an average complementizer. We have if there. And we said it's a complementizer because it occurs in complement distribution with subject inversion. If the, the C position is already filled with if, so you don't need subject of inversion, okay? Because the position of C is already filled with if, okay? So we said in embedded questions, there is a complementizer, which is others, and it's if. And the third point in yes or no questions, yes or no questions, there is a complementizer, but it's null. But what is the argument that there exists a complementizer in yes or no question? We said, uh, we used cross-linguistic comparison. We said languages such as English that use subject of inversion do not have a specific complementizer in forming yes or no question. And languages such as Irish, languages that have a specific complementizer in forming yes or no questions do not use subject of inversion. So subject of inversion and 
that complement Pfizer occur in complement distribution, which means that they are instances of the same thing. So even in English, in yes or no questions, there exists a complement Pfizer, but it's null. While in Irish and the languages that have an average complement Pfizer, that complement Pfizer is not null. And the last point is, is that coordination. If you can coordinate a question that has a complement Pfizer with a non-question, then that non-question also has a complement Pfizer. Indeed, we can do that. We can say, for example, you can lead a horse to water, but with it drink. So in this example, you, we can conjoin a question that has a complement Pfizer with a non-question. So this means that that non-question or statement also has a complement Pfizer. So the conclusion is that in English, there are complement Pfizer phrases everywhere with all clauses. Okay, so the re the, for this reason, we are going to start with CP whenever there is a sentence, whether it's a question or whether we have a, a statement, whether we have an embedded clause or whatever. Okay. If there is no question, then we can move to TP. Any question, please? Yes, please. Is there any question? Please, please Professor. Yes. Uh, we have seen before that uh, with the X-bar theory, we need to branch only two, two branch from one uh, node. Uh-huh, yes, go ahead. Here in uh, extend uh, X bar theory, mm -hmm. we, we we see that uh, from CP, we branch three, three, three branch. Uh-huh, and from TP, we have three branches. Yes. Yes, that's a good question, right. So uh, cons uh, 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 for TP, we will solve the problem here, okay? This is what we're going to talk about, tens of phrases. We're going to solve the problem will have only two branches. But for conjunction, we're not going to solve the problem, but in, in the master program, if, if you, okay, if you are accepted, if you pursue your studies in the master program in linguistics, so you will see that to solve this problem, as you said, Mr. Mohammed, we may claim that this is not a CP, this is conjunction phrase. If we use conjunction phrase, we will solve the problem. It's the conjunction which is lexical here, and it should be the phrase. It, it should be the head of the phrase. Normally, we should call it conjunction phrase, not CP. Conjunction phrase, conjunction bar, conjunction zero bar, then CP, uh, C is one bar, C bar, etc., etc., etc. You got the point, Mr. Mohammed? There is a solution to this. You are right that this is problematic but it's not sorted out in extended expert theory. In the future, so just think of it, we can solve this problem since the conjunction is the only lexical category. So instead of CP, we may call it conjunction phrase, then conjunction bar, then conjunction zero bar, then CP is, uh, uh, is the complement of uh, conjunction zero bar, okay? Uh, this is yes, only th this is only the case of conjunctions. This is only the case of the conjunctions. Uh, some grammarians, some syntacticians, for example, when we say the man and the woman, we 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 talked about x bar, x bar, uh, conjunction and and x bar. Okay, this is the way how you how you can uh, uh, branch uh, uh, phrases that are conjoined. For example, in bar, in bar, in bar, and end. Then you branch the man and the woman, or man and woman. Okay? But indeed, there is another way. You, you may call it conjunction phrase, because it's the only lexical category there. Okay? Anyhow, we're, we're not going to talk about this in this uh, uh, semester, maybe in, in the master program. Okay, so you're right, Mr. Mohammed. You're right. Yes, this is what we are, yep. we are. This is what we are going to move to. We are going to solve this problem. TP. Okay, TP. Okay. Professor. Yes. Yes, please. Who is speaking?
Okay, I'm going to move on. So the last part, okay, is um, tense place TP. What is wrong in the following expert rule? Yes, please. Think of uh, CP, C, and TP. What is wrong? Please, if you know the answer, raise your hand. Okay? If you know the answer, raise your hand, please. Okay? Okay? Uh, uh, Bill Kush, yes? Uh, it's uh, uh, t the head that is optional, which it should be uh, obligatory. The T exactly is yes. yes in the tense phrase. Yes, yes. yes. Okay. Um, this is the old view within X bar theory: TP, DPT, and VP. Uh, it's problematic because and and why? Can you explain, uh, uh, Miss uh, Dunia? Yes. Can you explain why 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 it is optional? Because sometimes we can have uh, a tense and sometimes we cannot, we cannot have it within the sentence. Give me examples. Um, For example, when we have auxiliaries. Yes, there is a, a T. There is a T. For example, yeah, you yeah. can do it. Yes, you can do it. Can is the, the tense. Uh -huh. And when we have sentences like... Uh, I, I I like uh, couscous. There is no auxiliary. Auxiliary. So this is the reason why T is optional. Yes. But what we are going to do now is to show that T is always there. Okay. This is the main point we we have to explain. We are going to show that we always have T. We, we, we do not have only T with uh, auxiliaries, but it's already there, okay? So the new view of TP is this one, TP, T bar, T zero bar. We, so in this chapter, we started with DP and we said DP, D bar, D zero bar. Then we move to CP, C bar, C zero bar. Now we finish with TP, T bar, T zero bar. Very simple, okay? What is somehow confusing is the argument, okay? So, what happens in clauses where there is no auxiliary? Is there a TP? Is there... So, we, we take it for granted that there is a T with auxiliaries. For example, you can do it, I will travel, etc. There is a T that we must write and the T. But what about other statements like I like couscous. What is T here? So we have to show that there is T even when we have inflectional endings or uh, I called you yesterday. Okay, so to answer this question we make recourse again to complement distribution and coordination. Remember, if two elements occur in complement distribution or if you can conjoin them using coordination, if you can conjoin them, it means they are instances of the same thing. They are examples of the same thing. Okay, fine. Now, what should we do? Please pay attention. I said we have T with auxiliaries. So if we find a, an auxiliary that occurs with inflection endings in complementary distribution, it means that we have we have T everywhere, okay, with all other clauses, okay? Now, look at these uh, uh, examples. We are, we, we, by the way, by the way, you should understand, you should understand that we have two types of sentences. We have the, the first sentence when we have auxiliaries, for example, I will travel, I, I should do it, etc. This is the first sentence. And the second one, when there is no auxiliary, I travel yesterday, I like couscous, etc. However, so what do we have here? What do we have? I travel yesterday so with the verb. We have inflectional morphemes. I hope that you understand the meaning of inflection morphemes. 
Okay, inflection morphemes are those morphemes that are attached to the verb. ED of the past. S of the subject verb agreement. We find it with third singular person. For example, she speaks, he speaks, it uh, 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 bites, etc. So that S of subject verb agreement is an inflection morpheme. ED of the past is an inflection morpheme. ING is an inflection morpheme. So inflection morphemes are those in, uh, uh, morphemes that are attached to the verb. They're, they are called inflection because they are inflected on the verb. Okay? So these are the only two sentences that exist in English. Okay? So either a sentence with an auxiliary or a sentence with an inflectional morpheme. For example, I traveled yesterday. We have ED. Or I like couscous, we have the inflection morpheme of the present tense, but it is null, it's not realized. When we say, for example, when we say, for example, we speak five languages, we, we, we speak many linguists say, almost all say that, or or they they, they agree, calmly agree on the fact that here when we say we speak there is a plural morpheme or or a morpheme and an inflection morpheme there that indicates plurality because as i said last time english is poor in terms of in terms of uh, morphology okay in terms of morphology in in arabic for example we say the heb to the heb the heb the heb na the heb the heb na etc the heb etc so we have different morphemes for different subjects in english you can say speak i speak we speak you speak they speak so you see it's the same thing you don't change the verb however there is an inflection morpheme there, but it is not realized. So this is just to explain that we have two, but we are going to focus on these two sentences, the one with uh, uh, auxiliaries and the one with uh, inflection morphemes. So if we can conjoin the two, it means they belong to the same thing. And if they occur in complement distribution, it means they belong to the same thing. Fine, tense inflection on a verb is in complementary distribution with auxiliaries. Fine, we cannot say the road runner is walks or is walkings. We have two categories here. We have is is an uh, is an auxiliary, and we have the inflection s is an inflection morpheme, and s here is an inflection morpheme. So. We cannot find the auxiliary and the, the tense inflection, which means they occur in complementary distribution. And since they occur in complementary distribution, it means that we have T. We have T not only with auxiliaries, but also with inflectional morphemes. We cannot say we are speak. We should say we speak. Or we should say we are speaking but we cannot say we are speak why or we cannot say she is speaks okay we cannot say she is speaks why because we cannot find is which is an auxiliary with an inflectional morpheme which is s so this means the occur in complement distribution you can never find them together Fine, they occur in complement distribution. So it means that since T is already uh, with auxiliaries, so we can also generate inflections uh, of tense under the T. Okay? Which means that this is only to prove that under T we find both auxiliaries and tense. Uh, verb inflections or tense inflections, such as uh, S of the subject verb agreement, such as ING, such as ED of the past. So we also branch them under T. We also branch under T, which means that if we have a verb in the past, like uh, I called yesterday, 
So under the ver the VP, you should write only call. And under T, you should write E date. Please, this is very interesting because now we have proven that under T, you should have both auxiliaries, will, can, do this, etc. And ED of the past and S of the subject of agreement and ING, etc. Because they should also be branched under T. Because we said they occur in complemented description with auxiliaries, which means are also tense. They, they should also branch under T. So if you verbs in the past, under the VP, you should write them only in the uh, only in infinitive form. Okay, for example, I saw you yesterday. So you should write here under the VP only C and here under T E D if it is in uh, simple past. If you have the past participle, you should write under the VP just I have done it. So under the VP just do. And under T E N, E N means we are talking about the past participle. Okay, so this is the argument. Since they occur, they occur, they refers to both auxiliaries and tense inflection. Occurring complementary distribution, this means that T can be realized both by auxiliaries and by inflectional endings and verbs. So the conclusion this is just an argument to show that we have T with auxiliaries. And with tense inflection. But the conclusion is that under T, you should write the auxiliaries, will, can, etc. And those inflection morphemes, ED of the past, I in T, uh, S of the, etc. Okay? The second argument, we, or we can use coordination. You can only coordinate two items that are of the same category and bar level. So if you can conjoin, again, a clause that has an auxiliary with a clause that has a tense inflection, then it's fine. Then, uh, then we have T with auxiliaries and with tense inflection. This is an example. We can say, I kiss the toad and must go wash my mouth now. So we have must here, which, which means we have an auxiliary with T. We can conjoin it with a verb which has inflection and in ED. So, since we can conjoin a clause with an auxiliary, which is with T, with a clause with an inflection ending, it means that we have T, okay, with auxiliaries and with, with uh, a sense inflection. So, energy will generate uh, uh, inflection endings and uh, uh, auxiliaries. This is the conclusion. And these are the arguments. If I ask you, for example, why should we branch under T, both auxiliaries and inflect endings. So you should say that, so first, uh, it's obvious that auxiliaries are branched under T, and for the inflectional endings, they occur in complement distribution with auxiliaries, and we can coordinate uh, together, which means that inflection endings must, uh, they are, and, and auxiliaries are instances of the same thing which means that they, they must all contain T, okay? This means, again, that both auxiliaries and inflection endings have a T out. Any, any question? Any question, please? So uh, there, is, there is only a slight difference between the auxiliaries and inflection endings. As you know, as you know, the auxiliaries can stand alone, but the inflection endings cannot stand alone because they are attached verb. They are always attached to the verb. Look at must here. Can stand alone. That e d inflection ending cannot stand alone. For this reason, for this reason, the auxiliary does not move while the inflection ending moves from T to the verb, as we'll see. So, auxiliary appear on the left, as you know, of the verbs, and inflectional suffixes like ED and S appear on the right. One difference. The second difference, unlike inflectional suffixes, auxiliaries undergo subject-verb inversion. Okay? 
we can say, for example, uh, where, where, where do you go? Or I will go. Where do you go? Subject uh, verb inversion. You cannot use it with with uh, inflectional morphemes. So, although both auxiliaries and inflection and these appear and they, they differ in whether they can stand alone or not. Okay? Auxiliaries are independent words and can stand alone. Stand alone. By contrast, suffixes like as inflectional suffixes have to be attached to a verb. Okay? So endings like S and E, they cannot be pronounced in isolation, so they move to attach to the verb. Now, now the main idea here is that both auxiliaries and inflection endings are generated under T. There is one difference in the movement. The inflectional endings must move down to the verb, as, as you can see here. Okay? As you can see here. The inflection endings. This in the past walk, I said earlier, I said earlier, you should write here only walk. You should write only talk. And the past ED here. Then move. You, you have to move it here from T to the verb. This is called the T to V movement. Remember this, I'm, I'm giving you a hint, okay? About uh, a chapter, uh, about the, the, the session of next week, because next week we'll talk about the movement. This is one type of the movement, T to V movement. So when we have inflection endings, we have to write the inflection morphine here and the T, then we, we, it must lower down. It must be attached to the verb because, because it cannot stand alone, it's not independent. But with auxiliaries, for example, if we have mass, can, etc., there is no movement. There is no movement. There is no affix lowering because the, uh, the, the auxiliaries are independent. They can stand alone. Is it clear? Is there any question? Is there any question? So this is the difference. So first, both. But both auxiliaries and inflection endings are generated under T. The only difference is that with auxiliaries, you have to, with, with uh, inflection endings, you have to move the inflection okay, to the verb. For example, if you have, uh, uh, I will go, so there is no movement, w will should remain under T. But if you have, she speaks three languages. So under the verb, you write speak, and S is under T. Then you move S to the verb. If you have uh, the past, you do like this. If you have ing, for example, I am speaking. So you have to write here, am. Um, uh, you have to write here, only speak, under T, verb to be, and plus ing. But ing must move down. Please remember, ing must move down. Must move down. If you have, for example, past participle, I have done it. So here you write do, and that you write have, plus, uh, okay, plus uh, uh, en, en, we use en for the past participle, okay, and it has to move down to uh, that do, okay? Okay, there is another way to do this, uh, another way, you can simply, you can write the past here, okay, you can write the past here. Uh, walked and you write here plus past empty okay now if it is present you write present if it is present continuous you write present plus continuous etc so I prefer the previous one this is called sectional analysis but this is what you have to follow uh, okay this now I think this is the end okay if there is no question professor this please yes can you show uh, yes. can you show uh, us how to uh, to do it uh, how to branch it which one uh, the last one this uh, movement you say about uh, ed in okay so uh, we haven't finished yet i'm going to do some practice please 
I'm going to send you uh, this recording of the practice. Of course. So the movement, the movement, yes. So let, let's work on these examples, okay? I'm going to do the first one for you, okay? So the men and women. Now, now let, let's start with a simple example, okay? A simple example. I, I will, uh, she speaks three languages, okay? She speaks three languages. Okay? She speaks three languages. Okay? Uh, she speaks three languages. Okay? So, please uh, remember, remember, uh, we said whenever there is a sentence, you have to start with CP, C bar, C zero bar. Then T P T bar T zero bar. Something very interesting here. You must remember. Please, from the T P, we generate the subject T P. Please remember, from the T P, we generate the subject T P. And then here V P, and you continue. Whenever you have a sentence, you have to start like this: C P C bar C zero bar T P. DP bar is about okay. Now the subject, the subject here, please remember. And from the TP, we have DP. P, the rule is D bar, D zero bar, and the NP. Forget about the NP. The in we we start with DP, D bar, D zero bar, NP. This is what we we talked about in bar, in zero bar, and then she. Okay. What do we have under t, uh, uh, v? Okay, v bar. We have the verb, which is speak. <laughs> we have speak. And here we have s. Okay, s of speaks. S, the, it must move. Okay. You branch it first under t, then it lowers down. Now, what do we have, please? What do we have after the verb here? What do we have here? Three languages, what do we have? Yes, please, come on. We have three languages, what is it? DP, right? DP. DP. Yes, DP, not NP. What is DP, D bar? D is robot, we have three, okay? Three, okay? And we have here the NP, in bar. Okay, no, languages, languages, okay, languages, okay, is it, is it clear now? Whenever you have a sentence, you have to start with CPC bar C, then TPT bar T, then VP, etc. And pay attention to the position of the subject. The subject is always branched from the TP. Please remember this. The subject is branched from the, uh, uh, branched from the P, okay? So, if you have a sentence, you start with CP, etc. If you have only a noun or noun phrase, for example, man, man or a man or whatever, okay, if you have a noun phrase, then you start with just with the DP. If you have a noun phrase, D bar, a DP, D bar, D, okay, an NP, bar, a noun, then man. Okay, and notice that we have noun alone with a determiner or without a determiner, you always start with the DP. I'm not going to repeat this, but you will have it in the exam. Whenever you have a noun or noun with a determiner or whatever, we always start with DP. Okay, and if you have VP, if you have, so this is if you have a, a DP, noun, right? And if you have a verb, for example, uh, uh, Called him, or we have an example. Uh, love, loved her, loved her intensely. Okay. If you have a noun phrase, uh, uh, the phrase, for example, loved her in intensely. So here, loved her with uh, the, the, this clause is a is a verb phrase. So you don't need to start with CP. Remember, please, we start with CP only when we have a sentence. If we have known phrase, we start with DP. 
if you have verb phrase, we start with TP. Okay, verb phrase, you start with TP. T bar, T zero bar. Okay, here we write E because we have the verb is in the past. Then the VP, then V bar, then T zero bar, and love. And you have to move this ED, okay, to the verb, its position here. Okay, then one, uh, 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 loved her, okay, loved her, okay, again, her is an MP, we start with DP, D bar, okay, D bar, D, then the MP here, okay, in bar, noun, and her. Okay, for intensely, we have to add another, okay, we have to add another uh, V bar. We have to add another V bar here, okay? Okay, we have to add so V B V bar here, V bar, and we branch uh, uh, the adverb phrase here. Adverb phrase, adverb bar. Adverb intensely. Okay, is it is it clear? Any question? So please now go to the examples. The old man, the, the old women and man died yesterday. So who can do it, please? The old women and men died yesterday. Who can do it? Okay, the old women and men died yesterday. Yes, please, who can do it? Please raise your hands. Who can do it? Uh, hi, yes, please. Yes, I think you were, you, you were here yesterday, right? Am I right? Yes, I were just at the beginning of the video, but I didn't uh, finish. Okay, um, Naima. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. We moved to somebody else. Naima. Yes, please. Yes, Naima. Somebody else who can do it? If there is no one, then we can move to... Uh, okay, Mr. Omar, yes? This is a sentence, Mr. Omar. Mm. Uh, first, we, we branch uh, CP. Okay, CP, yes. Yes, with the CP. Then? C? Uh, then uh, C bar. bar. Uh -huh. C zero bar. Uh -huh. uh, C, C. Then yeah. CP. Uh, whenever, whenever, CP. Whenever there is a sentence, whenever there is a sentence, you have to start with this without looking at the sentence. You have to do this first, then you can stop. T bar, T, then V. -P. Whenever you have a sentence, you have to draw this. This is the first thing you should start with. Okay? So what is the subject? The old uh, women and men. Yes, the old woman. Uh, from uh, uh, the DP. From the DP, yes, we have the bar. D zero bar, okay. Then the NP. Uh, so here we have the determiner. Uh, the, yes. Which and uh -huh. the NP. Uh, then uh, we brought from the NP we have uh, N bar. N bar. So here, uh, uh, then... old, old, let, let me explain one thing. Old is ambiguous. Maybe old refers to only women or both women and men. So. Let's say that it refers to both of them, women and men. Uh -huh. Yes? Uh, so we have, we have adjective phrase. phrase. We have uh, adjective okay. bar. Mm -hmm. Adjective. Old. old. Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. and, and bar because old is simply an adjunct. Okay? Yes. yes. But uh, okay. remember, Mr., uh, the rule of the adjunct. The rule of co coordination, if you still remember what it is, X bar, X bar, and X bar. So, uh, Mr. Omar, yes? 
in bar. Uh -huh. Don't give the point, sorry. Now, if, if we have conjunction, this is the rule in bar, conjunction. You, you forgot the rule of conjunction? X bar, X bar, X bar, conjunction? No, just ambiguous with the with the lines. Okay. Sorry, I didn't see so it. Whenever, whenever, whenever you have conjunction, this is the rule. If the conjunction between in P's, it should be in bar, in bar, conjunction, in P. If the conjunction between the phrase, it should be V bar, V bar, conjunction, V. We did it. Okay, yes, then N, then N zero bar, and uh, women, okay? And here again, N, and then men. Okay, so and, yes. and now we move to the verb phrase, yes, Mr. Omar. And T, we have ED because we have the past here. Yes, I, uh -huh. the from verb phrase the, from the verb phrase we have VBA. Uh -huh. uh, then, then, uh, then uh, verb. No, no, Mr. Omar. Yesterday is not a compliment, the adverb can never be a compliment. Okay, so it should be. It should be an adjunct sister yes, to V bar, yes. dominated by V bar. Okay, pay attention. Pay attention. The adverb can't be a complement. It can never be sister to V zero bar. Yes, yeah, sister to yes V bar. That's okay. Good. Okay, and this ed must lower it down here. Okay, the inflection must move that. Is it clear? Is there any question? Now you may you may say why this position of C and C P uh, 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 is empty. We needed questions in chapter twelve. We need that space, that position for questions. Okay, somebody else to uh, throw the tree for the second one. He won the competition, but he barely lapped with the organizing committee, okay? Okay, he won the competition. We have, we have two sentences, which means we, we have two CPs, okay? So, he won the competition, uh, okay? But he Refused. Okay. Two. He sorry. He barely laughed. Think think of it, please. Think of it. Okay. But he uh, barely laughed. Laughed with. Uh, the organizing committee. I'm sorry for uh, the space up here. Yes, please. So um, he won the competition, but he barely left with the organizing committee. I'm sorry for uh, the typing. Yes, please, we can do it. We have two clauses. The first one is he won competition. We have coordination here, and he barely left with the organizing committee, etc. Okay. So as I said, as I said, whenever there are two sentences, two clauses, and there is conjunction between them, so you should have CP. Okay. Conjunction here, which is but. And we have another CP here and a CP here because we have two clauses here. Okay, so who can continue now? Please remember, remember this rule. Who can do it? Who can do it, please? Okay, uh, Fetty, how can you do it? Yes, Professor. Uh, we have uh -huh. uh, okay. CP. Who, who is speaking? Uh, okay, yeah, so CP, C bar, uh, yes, C, 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 C
Tibor? Well, uh, so remember, whenever you have a sentence, so uh, you don't look, you don't need to look at the sentence, just write CP, C bar, zero bar, TP, T bar, T zero bar, and from here you write DP, and here you write VP. Then you can look at the sentence. The same thing you can do here CP, C bar, C, then TP, T bar, T, and here we have DP, and here we have VP. Then you can look at the sentence, okay? This is the first thing you should do. Now let's start with the first clause. He won the competition. Yes, please. Yes, Fatia. So, Professor, in the view of D bar. Okay, one moment, please. Yes. So the rule of DP is D bar, D zero bar. Okay, and, and then and P. Uh -huh. and bar, and bar, and, and he. he. Fine. Very good. Uh -huh. One. So T here we have uh, under T we have plus E D. We regular and irregular. Okay. So one the competition. So V bar. What is v? the function of the comp V? The the function of the competition. There is a, a complement. Complement. So the rise from uh, X bar sister to uh, X zero bar. Yes. So here, what should we write here? DP. DP, very good. Never it's an NP, it should be branched as a DP. The rule of DP is D bar, D zero bar. Here we have determinant, which is the. And here it is null. You don't need to write the null speech uh, symbol here. Okay, you don't need to do it. Then the NP, okay, an N bar, and noun, which is a competition, okay. Very good. Yes, and you move this ad here. Okay. But now we move to the second sentence. DP, D yes. bar, yeah. DP again, D bar, and D term. D and D. Yes, uh -huh. N bar, N, E. N bar, N, and he. Very good. Uh -huh. the, we put ed. Uh, in, in the the ed, ed yes. And the, T, and the VP, V bar. Yes, uh, adverb phrase. Very good, because we have the adverb phrase, uh, adverb phrase before the verb. Adverb phrase here. Adverb yes, bar. Yes, adverb. adverb. Barely. Adverb, barely. Okay. Good. V bar. Oh, the v, v bar, because bar. it is an adjunct. Very good, yes. Okay, and another V bar for for the the preposition phrase. This one, okay, for the preposition phrase with the organizing committee. There is no object left. Okay, no. there is no object here. Okay, so the verb laugh here. There is, no, there, is, there is no object here. Okay, there is no object here. Okay, yes, there is no object. And then we move this ed okay, to the verb. Now. Then the preposition phrase, uh, the rule, yes, yes, but yeah, continue, please. Continue, but yeah, please. E or, hello? Uh, what is, what is the rule? With the organizing committee. With the organizing. P bar, P zero bar, with, yes, yes very good. Then. then we have a DP. Yes, DP. Okay, very good. DP, not NP. Okay, D bar. D bar. E. D zero bar, which is the and the NP. Okay, yes. Very good. We have organizing committee. Yes, very good. Okay. Adjective phrase. Adjective, Adjective bar. Adjective Adjective Organizing, yes. And then we have in both organizing is only an adjunct. Yeah. Uh, and uh, in the name. very good, very good, very good. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes. Is there any question about this tree? Any question? Is it clear enough?
بروفيسور اسمي عمر ااا سيمز ذات ذير از نو سبيس فور تي بي اجين وير ااا فروم ذا هيد اوف ذا ذا هيد اوف برين So we may not uh, start by the TP again. I didn't get the point. So um, whenever there is a clause, you have to start with CP. Okay. Whenever there is a clause, you have to start with CP. Uh, suppose that I'm, I'm talking uh, this. What I'm going to explain right now. Uh, you may have a CP within CP. An example, an example is uh, when there is, for example, a close Okay, for example, I think, okay, I think that, okay, that uh, uh, you took it, for example. Mr. Omar, go ahead. Can you do it, please? I think that you took it. Yes, go ahead. This is a sentence. So, CP. I think uh, can can I can you please write down the sentence? I think, I think that you took it. I think that took it. Okay. So, so just, uh, just, C P. Uh huh. Okay. C P T bar C zero bar C P T bar T and here have D P and here we have V P. Fine. So in the D P, what is the subject? The subject is I. So DP, D bar. Yes, uh, from the DP, mm -hmm. D bar, then uh, then D, the subject, the subject, I. Okay. I think here T, uh, we don't need, uh, we need it, not, nothing. Okay, I think so, the V bar. So what is the verb? The verb uh, is From think. the VP, we have. Okay, the verb is think. So what is the object of the verb? What is the complement of the verb then thing? We have v. What is the object of the verb? Thank you. What is it? The CP. The CP, very good. We have that. I think that you took it. So it's like we start from the very beginning again. C B, C bar, okay, C, C B, T bar. C zero bar. Okay, here again we have DP as the subject and the V. You see, we have to repeat. We have to repeat the rule of CP, T bar C, TP, T bar T, etc. You have to repeat it because we have to close this. So you have to write this twice. Okay, so what do we have in the DP? Uh, the the complementizer here is that. Is that here? And DP, we have D bar, D zero bar. Okay, or you can write the determiner that uh -huh, the in P. Okay, uh, here the in P in bar. N here it should be U. Okay, then okay uh, you took here we have plus E D here, and the VP. V bar take. Okay, E D here. Okay, then here we have D P. Whenever you have a noun phrase, it should be it should branch as as an uh, a D P D bar D zero bar it P N bar and it. Okay, yes. So here uh, we have two clauses. I'm going to to draw this line just to 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 help you understand. But you shouldn't do it, okay? Just to understand that this is the first clause, and this is the second clause, okay? This is the first clause. This is the second clause because we have that, which means you have to repeat the same rule: C P C bar C, P T bar T, V P C. It must be repeated because we have a clause. Is that clear? So the last sentence, yes, it's clear. the last sentence, or the last, an old man from Brazil, an old man from Brazil. So, uh, who can do it, please? Somebody else. 
an old man from Brazil. Yes, please, who can do it? Uh, somebody else? Uh, and by the way, I'm, I'm saving screenshots of those who participate. That's why if you know the answer, you should raise your hand because I'm taking screenshots, okay? It means that these are the students who frequently participate. Mr. Nordin, yes, please. An old man from Brazil. Uh, DP. This is a known phrase. We should start yeah. with DP. We don't start with CP, C bar, TP, T bar, etc., because this is not a sentence. Please remember, we, we start with CP, C bar, C zero bar, etc., only when we have sent a sentence, okay? So DP, D bar, DP. yes. Mm -hmm. D. Uh huh. N bar, N uh, P. So here N, okay. N P, yes. Uh, N bar. N bar. Adjective mm -hmm. phrase. Okay, adjective phrase. Adjective bar. Adjective. adjective bar. Old. Adjective old, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and bar because this is bar, only yes, an ad. Yes. Uh -huh. And bar N. Uh, but don't forget, Mr. Norden, don't forget from Brazil is simply an ad. Yes, adjunct, yeah. Uh, uh, we so, draw it from N bar. It? Yes, like it is. Uh, yes. From from N bar and sister to N bar. So in then bar. here now. No. Which is man. Uh -huh. Okay. And then preposition P -bar. continue. P -bar, P bar. Uh huh. Then. P position and here B D B very good yeah. D B so here from, D P D yes. bar D D bar uh, D D N P then, okay N P yes N P N bar N, bar, N, N Brazil Brazil yes it should be like this very good and thank, thank you, you very much uh, if there is no question i'm going to start here and you have a session this saturday at 10 o'clock 10 o'clock in the morning 10 o'clock you have a session okay i'm going to go all the groups together okay you have a session this saturday at 10 o'clock why because i want to finish the program as early as possible so that we can have extra exercises, etc. If you want just to finish the program and we stop, then we don't need the session of Saturday. Okay. So, uh, is there any question, please? Any question about what we uh, did today? I'm going to send you the recording of the practice. So um, we stop here and um, uh, happy Eid. Eid Mubarak say to all Eid of Mubarak you. Eid Mubarak say, okay. Professor. Thank you and um, yeah, and see you, see you this Saturday, inshallah. Eid Mubarak say. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all. Thank you all for your wishes. Thank you.